chemistry, and Professor D.P. Shukla, head of the Department of Medicine, Sarkati Medical College, on the stage to chair the first session. Madhur Dine, let us open our minds for a new session. It has been one new welcome of esteemed speaker, Professor Niraj Kumari, Dean Academics, and Rivalry, to guide us through the unexplored views of this captivating new topic, Newer Diagnostic Modalities in Diagnostic Modalities. Please put the big round of applause for them. I, do, I would like to request Professor Dr. Ayas Das, sir, to introduce our speaker, Professor Dr. Nuris Marina.
but for diagnosis, the tests, the common tests are used for all the categories to diagnose. So the tests do not discriminate between type 1 and type 2, but it is actually the clinical presentation and the management which differs. Now for diagnosis, the uh, three important tests which is done are fasting plasma glucose, the two are plasma glucose after I go the challenge of 75 gram of glucose and the glycosylated hemoglobin which we commonly call as HPA1C. Now these are the tests which are used for diagnosing all kinds of diabetes. And these tests are also used both in diagnosis as well as screening. Now uh, just uh, before we collect the sample we should know what variables can affect the test results. So a uh, sample for estimation of uh, plasma glucose or blood glucose should always be collected in a chloride vial. And it should be immediately centrifuged because we know that the dialysis use glucose and if there is a delay in uh, separating the uh, plasma, there is a, a low level of glucose which should be kept in the result, which is again superfluous. If you uh, the person who is collecting the sample, if they do not properly mix the sample, again the samples will demolize and will give us a wrong result. So some of these three factors should be taken into account while collecting the blood sample. Now coming to the first test, which is the fasting plasma glucose. Fasting means the patient should be uh, fasting only for 8 hours prior to sample collection. So patient can have its right genome at around 10, 10 pm in the night and in the morning patient can come for giving the fasting sample. Now the values which indicate a healthy adult is a fasting plasma glucose less than 100 mg per day. If it is more than 126, 126 or more than 126, it is uh, diabetes mellitus. However, if it is 100 to 125 mg per day, according to the mental diabetes of the patient, it is impaired fasting glucose. However, the WHO says still it uh, recommends 110 to 125 mg per deciliter as impaired fasting glucose. For the 2-hour plasma glucose tolerance test, the 75 gram glucose is given as oral challenge. This test is mostly used for gestational diabetes mellitus. And in this, the patient should be on a carbohydrate carbohydrate diet for the last few days because if the patient avoids carbohydrate or keeps fasting that my sugar will come low, then that will be a superfluous result. So fasting or less carbohydrate or carbohydrate restriction can again uh, decrease the uh, blood sugar or even the wrong result. So the patient should be advised to be on a mixed carbohydrate diet, three days at least five. If one test is abnormal test should be repeated, not the normal test. Samples, as I said earlier, it should be simply to immediately as soon as it is which is the lab which is collected. So the delay at the collection and delay in the lab should not happen when we are dealing with plasma glucose estimation. Conditions that affect the collection of hemoglobin should be kept in mind. The conditions which can alter this glycosylation. Patients of different ethnicity and different populations may have different uh, HPA1C levels. For example, the African Americans, they are, although the results are different in different studies, but the African Americans are said to have higher HPA1C than as compared to non hispanics They are also said to have a higher fructosamine and a high glycosyl adrenaline levels. The higher HPA1C has been also reported in type 1 patients, but in the Tanzania uh, studies, they have shown a lower so, at the end, the take home message is that a selection of the right lab, which, is, which follows the guidelines of National Guidance of Clinical uh, Vital School, the uh, collection, the right collection of the blood samples, collection in the right vial, collection in the right network, and through the right test may provide a more accurate and reliable diagnosis, which can be kept in the anxiety conditions to manage the patients of diabetes. HPA1C, despite having some disadvantages, it is still a most regular test and the gold standard for diagnosis of diabetes. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for such a wonderful and exciting session. To felicitate our honorable speaker, I would like to invite all the chairpersons to uh, give us a moment to please.
प्लीज उन सभी की बोलो बी ग्राउंड अवार्ड्स I am to consider our chairperson. I would like to call this case, Professor Dr. Ramkant Sir, uh, to give them our momento. I will call the name. Professor Arish Das Sir. Privileged and honoured uh, to be chairing the session, and uh, would extend uh, uh, congratulations to the Department of Medicine. And uh, there is no more introduction required to uh, Dr. Ankit as he is one of the assets uh, for AIMS Library. After coming, uh, after uh, his joining, many of the consultants have uh, showed a lot of interest in sending the patients, and uh, uh, very good reviews have been uh, given to the patients for his work. So I would like to welcome Dr. Ankit to give the presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mukul, for, for his warm words. Good morning to all. As a co-organizing secretary, I welcome you all in the mid-term annual CME, cardio organized by the our, uh, Department of Cardiology and uh, General Medicine. So my uh, today's talk is on resistant hypertension and its approach to the pulse management. 
So, as we all know, hypertension is the most commonest uh, health issue in our country. It is uh, causing over 1.6 million uh, deaths annually and it accounts around the more than 10%, 10% of the total mortality in our country. So, and it is being classified as uh, uh, high normal uh, stage 1 to isolated systolic hypertension by the latest guideline of International Society of Hypertension in 2023. So there are various types of hypertension we all know with the, uh, according to the range of the hypertension that's with the primary hypertension which was which is now the new term for the essential hypertension, secondary hypertension, isolated, systolic hypertension and resistant hypertension. So talking about the resistant hypertension, pseudo-resistant hypertension, apparent apparent resistant hypertension and uh, 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 pseudo resistant hypertension and resistant hypertension. So in the absence in the absence of the uh, controlling test, the resistant hypertension is defined as the blood pressure measurement about the target goal of the uh, blood pressure if it is used uh, if we are using more than equal to the three three uh, drugs which should be of different classes that is more important and it includes uh, one diabetic or if it is uh, we are using the four more than four different classes of the uh, antihypertensive drugs and it is being controlled so it is called as resistant hypertension. So more the uh, pseudo pseudo resistant hypertension, suboptimal blood pressure control, secondary to the medication, non adherence white coat effect, or the poor measurement technique, apparent treatment resistant hypertension. The cases in which the patient meets the criteria of the resistant hypertension but have the unverified adherence or medication or have not undergone through the office blood, blood office uh, pressure monitoring uh, to rule out the white coat hypertension. So here is the uh, uh, study with, uh, by Bert uh, et al. It was estimated the prevalence of most commonest cause of the pseudo treatment resistance is the medication non adherence white coat effect under the treatment under under antihypertensive treatment and uh, white uh, even even there is a uh, inaccurate blood pressure management uh, measurement. So we should know all the correct method of the measurement of blood pressure, which is being uh, shown and beautifully in this picture. Uh, the patient should be sitting sitting with a quiet room comfortable temperature resting before uh, the 3 to two, uh, 5 minutes resting before the blood pressure manage, uh, measurement and there should not be any drug effect. Regarding the uh, prevalence of the resistant hypertension, there are various studies has been done uh, in all over the world but, but still the true, true prevalence of the resistant hypertension is still unknown. But uh, there are various clinical trials which suggest that it is near about values 10 to 30 percent of the hypertension patient in general general population. It is a large cohort study uh, which was published published by uh, so, uh, Soleni Iqbal, uh, which clearly revealed that the, that the resistant hypertension, which is this is approximately prevalent to 15 percent and is strongly associated with the age, female gender and smoking habits. And it has a strong independent association with the uh, uh, micro and macro albuminuria and TGFR less than 60 with advanced re uh, retinopathy. So we, we already know the various causes of resistant hypertension that is may, uh, may be related to the substance abuse of the drug like anti-depression, uh, glucocorticoids, various hormonal, hormonal uh, contraceptives and even, even there are various secondary causes of the resistant hypertension of the pseudo-resistant hypertension. 
this there is a strong relationship between the hypertension and the diabetes as the hypertension is present in more than 50% of the patients with diabetes and contributes significantly to both macro and micro vascular diseases so uh, the cardi all the, the cardiovascular diseases the image are more Uh, more four and that is more than four times of the higher than in the patients with with uh, both having the both diabetes as well as the hypertension compared with the normal tensile patients who uh, are more about the the diabetes and the hypertension is strongly and strongly associated with uh, several type of uh, type of physiological mechanism leading to various severe micro and micro uh, macro cardiovascular diseases. So we should we should uh, all need to maintain the blood pressure on a diabetic hypertensive patient uh, below the 140 to 140 by 80 millimeter of mercury. <coughs> hypertensive uh, diabetic patients are more prone for the uh, cardiovascular diseases and accelerate the atherosclerotic process and leading to various macro and uh, micro. Uh, diseases similarly the endothelial dysfunction vascular uh, vascular inflammation vascular fibrosis and arterial remodeling that all leads to the macro vascular diseases in diabetic and hypertensive patients the uh, these these are the uh, these all pathophysiological mechanism that are responsible for the resistant hypertension and that makes the clinical situation associated with the difficult to control the Uh, the blood pressure. There are various anti-hypertensive uh, agents. We already know that uh, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, diuretics, thiazide uh, like drugs, uh, uh, diuretics, mineral corticoid receptor inhibitors. So uh, now coming on to the approach for the management of resistant hypertension, we all need to. Uh, First, we need to exclude the zero resistance. Resistance that is uh, that is the first step uh, of the ma management. And thereafter, we we have already discussed that which uh, about the zero resistance hypertension. Now, the second approach is to identify and reverse the uh, contributing the lifestyle uh, factors and discontinue the uh, or reducing the endo endothelial substances. Screen for the secondary hypertension. Thereafter, give the ph ph pharmacological treatment in the fifth step. And and if it is still not controlled, then you need to uh, refer it to the specialist for the further intervention if, because the patient may need any intervention also. So there are various recommended steps in the management of the uh, uh, resistant hypertension in diabetic patients. to improve the lifestyle changes to uh, evaluate the evidence exclude the pseudo resistant hypertension recheck the secondary causes optimize the pharmacological therapy and consider for the new uh, strategies like rdm that is uh, renal sympathetic denervation uh, the uh, early diagnosis of the resistant hypertension is the key Of the treatment that includes the appropriate lifestyle, which uh, and the anti-hypertensive drugs like diuretics, ACE inhibitors, or beta blockers, or in case of patient with obese, uh, obesity or the metabolic uh, syndrome, uh, the fourth class of the drug of choice is the spironolactam. The the approach to the resistant hypertension in diabetic uh, patient is to screen all the diabetic patient for the hypertension, assess assess the blood pressure control. on follow up. First consider consider for different uh, different class of drugs that includes the AC inhibitors, ARBs, or uh, uh, calcium channel blockers, or and uh, the diuretics. So first, uh, then again we need to as we assess the uh, blood pressure on the on the follow up. If the target blood pressure is not achieved in three different drugs, then we need to consider for the fourth fourth class that is more uh, mineral mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. If it is still not not controlled, then we need to go for the uh, 
kind of mentioned. So lifestyle modification, we have all, uh, this is the most important, uh, most important step which we overlooked to reduce the salt intake, uh, increase the consumption of the uh, fruits and vegetables, low uh, fat, dairy, uh, dairy products, increasing the physical activities and avoiding the alcohol consumption. Now, now, coming on to the uh, de-innervation therapy, the instant uh, de-innervation therapy, new, uh, new strategies for the management after the pharmacological therapy. So, uh, de-innervation therapy is basically based on the sympathetic pattern of the uh, renal, renal uh, nerves. So, so the various uh, technologies is based on the ultrasound, ultrasound radio frequency, or uh, even the injection based. These are the latest technologies which we which we do for the uh, renal innovation therapy. So the, the uh, device based therapy to treat the hypertension damped after the result of the simplicity uh, trial that was a landmark trial. Uh, the new uh, new trial has been uh, emerged, uh, giving the significant uh, positive data on the on the control uh, of resistant hypertension. That is the spiral uh, is spiral hypertension on uh, met radians, which uh, solo or trial trials. This is the latest uh, uh, latest uh, study uh, published in JAK in 2020, which uh, reduced hypertension reinforced, which uh, basically uh, is, uh, gave the significant uh, positive result at uh, six months, in which uh, the, with more than 50 percent uh, of the patient of uh, uh, showed the office and ambulatory blood pressure uh, reduced significantly. With a uh, with a renal innovation therapy. Now, uh, still, still the question remains same that uh, whether it is effective or not uh, because because there are various studies which which shows uh, where it has various limitations in in their uh, in their study. Another uh, another new uh, technology is the for the management of the resistant hypertension is back back that is baroreflex activation therapy which actually uh, uh, inhibiting the sympathetic nervous system and enhancing the parasympathetic nervous system. So here is the that baroreflex uh, is a device which we which we use for the back baroreflex activation therapy. There are uh, various some uh, some new new drugs also which are on trial like uh, non-steroidal corticoid receptor antagonist and uh, double uh, double uh, endothelium receptor antagonist which may give promising effect on resistant hypertension in future. So at, uh, in the last uh, uh, slide, the patient with a resistant hypertension should be screened for the reversible causes first such as uh, renal artery stenosis or primary aerosolism uh, and uh, the obstructive sleep apnea. There are uh, various, uh, we, should, we should counsel the patient for the, for the uh, lifestyle modification and uh, uh, spironolactone uh, in a dose, low dose even can improve the, uh, improve the blood pressure in the, man and the uh, resistant hypertension even. Like, uh, is there any like uh, 
in some patients, there might be some non depressed where the blood pressure doesn't come. So, can we give you medicines at night or at night time? Like, are there any patients like that? Um, yeah, we usually, we give uh, uh, medications at evening also like in diuretics because it acts very slowly. So we give usually in the, uh, at, in the evening, e evening time so that they can sleep normally because whenever we sleep there is a overload, overload and th that causes everything, the sympathetic activation, uh, overload. If the patient is symptomatic then it is all about the sympathetic nervous system activation. So whenever we sleep at night, there is an overload, and that increases the sympathetic system in a in a patient who are already uh, known case of the resistant hypertension or hypertension or any any other disease which cardiovascular uh, diseases uh, or uh, any cardio uh, cardiomyopathies that can be a high, uh, hypertensive cardiomyopathies or uh, coronary. Because of the coronary. Yeah, we we, uh, we usually do the uh, ambulatory uh, monitoring the 24 hours, which we which we see that there is a night night taking of the blood pressure, and that is the uh, that that gives the little bit of uh, that uh, for the for the diagnosis only, not for the management. It is only for the diagnosis. You know, in a mask in a mask hypertension. Sometimes we do, we do the uh, even the exercise test. Uh, that is, uh, every, uh, most of the persons knows that uh, that the TMT is used for the coronary. It is not only for the coronary. It is to diagnose the hypertension also. So just to add to what Dr. Ankit has said regarding the coronavirus. So there were a lot of even five years back, four or five years back, that you could give anti hypertension in the evening. But we need the trials have uh, you know already proven that there is hardly any role of giving antihypertensive solely in the TV. So now the current practice is you can prescribe antihypertensive irrespective of time. So but then identifying the non reverse is equally very important. For that you definitely have to depend on the antihypertensive In fact, it has become almost a practice of today to before escalating the antihypertensive therapy, you must apply the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring just to document as to how blood pressure is behaving at the time. The time is gone when you are taking a single reading and escalating the dose of antihypertensive. And even before embarking on when this is resistant hypertension, I personally believe that adequate time should be given for the effect of the drugs to come. Yes, yes, yes. This one? Yeah. Actually, there is. Uh, you want to you want to ask the mechanism? It, it actually there is. There are some barrel receptors which are present in the carotid sinus on the aortic arch. So that that, that basically is uh, supplied by the uh, ninth cranial nerve that activates the cardiovascular center and. Uh, Vasomotor center. So basically, it inhibits the sympathetic system and enhances the parasympathetic system by accelerating the activation of the two uh, uh, sinus, uh, carotid sinus only. We place the place the device in the like a pacemaker only. It it it, it also it, it also helps in the in the patient with the heart failure. It is approved, already approved for the heart failure patients. It acts like a CRT, a CRT device for the synchronization of the ventricles. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for such a wonderful talk on resistant hypertension and diabetes. I would like to
It was our chairperson to come on stage to felicitate our speaker, Dr. Ankit Gupta, sir, uh, with momento and certificate. And to felicitate our chairpersons, I would like to request Dr. Razi Burba, Assistant Professor, Department of Medicine, to come on stage. Our chairpersons were Dr. Mukul Sarma, Dr. Ananya Soniman, and Dr. Mumbai Sutta. Let's continue our learning exhibition and for the next session, I would like to call on stage the chairpersons, Professor Pragati, Professor and Head of Department, Department of Ophthalmology, Dr. Danishwar, Danishwar S. Padavi, Associate Professor, Department of Blood Bank and Transfusion Medicine, and Dr. Sachitanan, Assistant Professor, Department of Pharmacology. Let's extend a warm welcome to our next speaker on the stage. Doc is on generation two and zooming in clinical practice, initiation and intensification. I would like to request Professor Pradati Gurbham to come and come on podium to introduce our speaker. Good morning everyone. I'm happy and honored to be a part of this conference as a chairperson. And really happy to introduce a very dynamic speaker of this session. Professor Ravi Khan, who has a remarkable academic career. Uh, presently, he is working in Department of Medicine, Ames Rishikesh, and he has got to his credit him with an award, Best Researcher Award, and also awarded with various prestigious fellowships both nationally and internationally. And he has got a number of publications both in, in national and international journals. So I would like to invite Professor Vita Sata as his own person. So, so what is the scenario of control of diabetes in India or anyway in different countries like ours and uh, in countries like lower and middle income countries? We are not able to achieve 40% patients who are well controlled with diabetes. That is to say, as we can see, I mean, 7% is hardly achievable in the Indian scenario. And to a very kindly percentage is not more than 12% in the Indian scenario, we are not able to achieve as we will see of 11 7. So definitely there is an unmet demand to basically intensify the treatment of maintaining. And the uh, out of five, you say, four people are not within the range. This definitely predisposes to a, uh, you know, people of complications or micro methodological complications. So earlier and appropriate intervention may improve patients' chances of reaching the goal. So if you look at the OED, combination of OED, as one therapy, dual or total combination therapy, and if you incorporate insulin, you find that the chances of achieving non-glycemia, that we will see 11, 11, 7 percent is 
प्रोडक्ट पर्सन को इंस्ट्रूमेंट दे सके विच इज नॉट अचीवेड बाई वन टू और थ्री और कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ दीज एंटीबायोटिक ड्रग्स द पीपल एक्सपीरियंस टू लॉन्ग पीरियड्स ऑफ टू एड लाइस इन कंट्रोल विच इज डेटरमेंटेड टू लॉन्ग टर्म आउटकम्स बेसिकली and of course patients remain in poor class in control for more than 7 years with intensive treatment with insulin therapy and this is a little bit that any time in the course of uh, treatment of diabetes if a patient is well controlled he or she is predisposed to less amount of complications any time in the life after even uh, the glucose becomes uncontrolled so this shows if you have a better control of diet in the cases of the development of diabetes The chances of them becoming very, very less in this population. So there is 24 percent reduction in the cardiovascular complications, 15 percent reduction in the MI, and of course 13 percent all-cause mortality is reduced if you achieve uh, HbA1c less than seven in the early course of the development of diabetes mellitus. So when we consider insulin in diabetic patients, of course, increased HbA1c is one area where uh, you have. Uncontrolled as we have seen for more than six months, and patient is already on two or triple antidiabetic drugs. The early manifestation of diabetes complications. The elderly patients who are having sarcopenia, AKC, or chronic infections, of course, are candidate for insulin. Cell group with single insulin deficiency, and these are the patients who are young, lean and fit patients. And symptoms of high blood sugar that is. Patients who are having weakness, or we in, in short we give uh, we call these patients insulin-dependent patients. These patients, you know, benefit a lot. A patient who is diabetic and complaining of weakness, weakness, weakness all the time, please put him on insulin. It's another hormone. He will feel better. And diabetic has nothing to do. A patient who is diabetic has got erectile dysfunction. This is absolutely indicated for insulin. Even when the patient is having well controlled blood sugar, this is one of the indications. Patients with dysautonomia, so they are some you know area where you really need to look and further on to start the insulin well in time. Now, why should we look beyond OEDs for managing type two diabetes mellitus? Definitely, when lifestyle modification is largely failed, HP will see our target even on three OEDs. OED class should include one sulfonylurea, one methylamine, third may be anything. And then comorbid conditions causing hypoglycemia have been ruled out. So, for example, a patient is not having steroids, or patient doesn't have chronic infections, or something which is leading to a high uh, blood sugar. Or patients separately only period can be defined as development of insulin clinic signs and move from total glycemia in spite of using to do OED therapy. So, they all are the indications. So, what is the role of these three oral antidepressants? It has been seen that. There is hardly any benefit of adding third drug or more than three drugs to the treatment of diabetes. So there is hardly any benefit of adding fourth drug in the treatment of uncontrolled hypoglycemia. It hardly brings down the HbA1c to the target. So this is the uh, reason why we keep three drugs as a as a benchmark for calling that this is a uncontrolled hypoglycemia or OHA failure. And we see that as the uh, fast of blood sugar is rising, HbA1c is also rising. So by uh, you know by virtue of uh, fast of blood sugar, doesn't mean that it is only fast of blood sugar. It is the blood sugar which the patient is experiencing throughout the night. It is just a screenshot, a snapshot of what the patient has experienced throughout the night, and that is the importance of you know fast of blood sugar. So fast of blood sugar is a very strong predictor of how high HbA1c is going to be. Number two, higher rates of complications, be it micro, macro, vascular problems, because patients remain in this state for a pretty long time, maybe 12 hours, 14 hours, or 10 hours, whatever amount it may be. The holistic glycemic approach is you need to first control the elevated heart glycemic. That can be controlled in fast blood sugar, has to be controlled with basal insulin, that is, long acting insulin, has to be controlled for control. It has been seen that the moment we control the You know, fast blood sugar. The excursions, the exposure to excursions, are also controlled. So the dilemma is, you have to fix the fasting first. You need not embark on the postprandial hypoglycemia. You should not consider postprandial hypoglycemia control. Please go for the control of fasting blood sugar first. Once this is controlled, then only you divert attention towards the 
always going to have a blessing. Till then, please be patient. Patient may be impatient, some are issue is under control. But your approach is very meticulous and straightforward. I have to control the fasting first before embarking on the postman and the senior. Pre-trained fasting activities do lower the entire 24 hours glucose profile, including postman and glycemic exertions. At the same time, the practical aspect is are the patient to order the diet so as to control the postman and glycemic. I am pretty sure that with this regime, both the patients they do get control. Now we have pre-mix insulin, we have basal insulin that is locked in. Pre-mix insulin is rarely or hardly used these days, except for some you know, situations. So definitely the basal insulin regimen are considered to be simple and flexible. They lower the risk of hypoglycemia and they have better treatment satisfaction so far as the patient quality of life is concerned. Now how to initiate and titrate basal insulin therapy? The data is please start with 10 international units or 0 0.1 unit to 0.2 units per kg per day. That's probably at the back time. But it's not only back then. You can administer any time of the day. Whatever the patient is feeling comfortable. Now how to go about monitoring the fasting blood glucose daily to titrate the fasting blood sugars? The dictum is fix the fasting first. So once you have target reach that is 100 to 130 mg per deciliter, which is the most appropriate blood sugar for diabetic patients, then you go for the dose titration. How to type the dose once a week or twice a week, you can increase the basal insulin, uh, you know, to the patient. Maybe by one or two units, depending on the comorbidity of the patients. And intensification, for intensification, you need to monitor PTMG. Now, fasting blood sugar, the obvious that, which is basically controlled. Now, you look at PPBG levels once, fasting blood glucose targets achieved, and add bolus insulin if it is required. If it is not required, please. Uh, you know, we consider about the uh, continuing this regimen for uh, three months and then we have the patient by HPVCN. So, what are the ADSAs? The, if the HPVC has target at basal insulin, choice of basal insulin should be based on personal specific considerations, including cost. So, a cost, you know, constrained countries like India and other low, low and middle income countries. We need to embark. We have trials on NPH, which is, you know, cheapest instrument available, which is equally efficacious. So, add basal analog or wet and NPH insulin, set the passing vertebral target first, choose the base titration of all them, increase two years every three days. So, in a week, you can't do bio more than two times. And the days should be fixed, like in our diabetic, you say, increase the dose on Sunday and that's it. And don't touch in between, don't do anything to the insulin. Then for hypoglycemic revision, you need to give the cause, if no clear reason, lower the dose by 10 to 20%. Once you find there is no uh, reason for hypoglycemia, dose reduction should be, should be done. The titration period is definitely, you know, uh, 12 weeks, that is 3 months, and maintenance period is after, uh, 12 weeks are over. So you need to reassess the patients on a continuous basis. The titration period is often defined as a time frame of up to 12 weeks following the initiation or switch of basal insulin flow. Yes, so this is glycemic response during 12 weeks and after 12 weeks therapy is a predictor for mid to long term glycemic control. So if you achieve the glycemic control early, the later on glycemic control is also better. So there is no need to wait for the uh, you know OEDs to fail. If you ask me a simple question, who are the candidates for insulin therapy? The answer is all diabetic patients. All diabetic patients are potential candidates for insulin therapy. Provided they are fully motivated and they are ready to take. Factors that contribute to titration of inertia, reluctance by the healthcare provider, the patient of the board, they are reluctant to initiate insulin. The issues of weight gain, fear of hypoglycemia, effect of insulin therapy, of quality of life, lack of education, complex hydration algorithms, lack of constant self glucose monitoring, and of course, lack of flexibility. But these regimes are quite flexible. I mean, the patients can do it, uh, do it himself. So, uh, the area recommendations for insulin titration was the basal insulin that is initiated at 10 minutes per day. Titration should be performed every three days or <coughs> two times a day. Intensification is Somehow it is done by increasing the dose of the basal insulin and by adding the you know bolus insulin once the fasting is fixed. 
If the patient is somehow not, uh, you know, uh, adhering to this regimen and there are high blood sugar, then who will that? Who will that? It is a question of stage A or it is a patient of a preserved or reduced or highly reduced patient fraction. But the biggest challenge is diagnostic accuracy of MD pro BNP and BNP. Especially during medicine, when the patient comes to us with pneumonia and they say, I am having dyspnea, it becomes a very challenging. It is dyspnea is due to your heart failure, it is due to your pneumonia. So if we see the negative predicted value in the acute setting, it's 0.94 to 95. But if we see positive predicted value, it's just 0.66. That means ruling out heart failure is a very good marker. But making a diagnosis of heart failure is not a good marker. So it is more useful in the acute setting for noting that they are ruling out heart failure. If it's empty to the is normal, we say, OK, it is not heart failure. But if it is raised, then we have to see other etiologies, rule out other etiologies to say that it is a heart failure patient. And one more challenge is in patients, especially who are obese and women, they have a lower level of anti pro BNP as, and patients who are CKD or in AI, they have a higher level of anti pro BNP. There are also cut off changes in these cases. So you have to be very sure, careful in diagnosing these patients going for your heart failure. So, what the recommendation? Now, yesterday only, ESC later deletes these indications. ESC guidelines, when to suspect all patients. Who are diabetic, they should be evaluated in the OPD. Sorry. They should be evaluated for suspicion of heart failure. And if we find any suspicion of heart failure, they should undergo a eco or anti PP levels in your setup. So, when I diagnosed, okay, this patient might be at risk, or it may be a patient of reduced ejection fraction, or it may be a patient of reserve. So, what treatment would be given to these patients? So, coming first to stage A, that is at risk, that I found that this patient is having a heart failure with a risk factor, that means he still his ego is normal, but he is for having a development of increased risk. So can we prevent heart failure in these patients? Now two drugs have been evaluated very elaborately in these patients. One is LG-20 inhibitor and another is a pyridone. LG-20 inhibitors are basically, they have, the mechanism of this basically is these are having a kidney LG-20 uh, receptors are there, which will inhibit and will increase glucose media and lead to sugar control. But the trials showed that these patients, except this drug having effect on kidney, this drug has effect on the myocardial bone. It changes your metabolic deficiency, it increases the diastolic relaxation, and after afterload reduction, which leads to improved cardiac structure and function. So this drug then started being evaluated in the patients seeing the cardiovascular outcomes in diabetic patients. This was the first study, Imparex study, which showed that when you give this drug, there was significant reduction of heart failure and hospitalization in diabetic patients who were not having any heart failure at the baseline. And the declared TV trials say to show that these patients, when you give this drug, there was significant reduction in your heart failure and hospitalization. So depending on this analysis, the ACC came up with the guidelines. If you find a diabetic patient with a stage A, that means he is having underlying cardiovascular disease or they will have an increased risk of developing heart failure. It's always better to give a SGLT2 inhibitor along with other anti diabetic in these cases. This a new molecule of pinadenone is basically a sort of non steroidal selective MRI inhibitor antagonist, which basic purpose is to block the receptor receptors. But it has an additional effect of your decreasing the inflammation and the fibrosis. So, thus, it is a stiffness in the myocardium and it decreases the reaction in the BNP. So this drug was basically evaluated in the patients in diabetic kidney disease. And when these diabetic kidney disease patients were evaluated, they found that they had a significant reduction in your heart failure and hospitalization also. So this was a DKD uh, trial which uh, only included patients who have a diabetic kidney disease of your urea platelet ratio of 30, more than 30 to 5,000. And GFR more than 25 and serum potassium less than 4.8. And the outcome, they found there was significant reduction in the cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. And this was also basically driven by a heart failure and hospitalization in this setup. So depending on, because of these two data, ESC came with the recommendation. If you find these patients stage A with diabetic kidney disease, it's a class 1 indication to give SGLT2 inhibitor along with pyridone in these cases. Now pyridone is available, it's come in the brand name Gadbear and the 10 mg OD dose and it has been shown that it has reduced reduction of heart failure hospitalization and progression of CKD also in these cases. What about the patients who already developed heart failure? Is there any difference between diabetic versus non-diabetic in the setup? 
So basic purpose for giving treatment is to decrease the symptoms and have a better mortality and morbidity in these cases. So if we see diabetic treatment versus non-diabetic, there is not difference. Whatever heart failure treatment you are going to prescribe to a non-diabetic, you have to prescribe to a diabetic also in these cases. The only thing is the absolute risk reduction in these cases will be definitely higher in diabetic and number needed to treat will be much lower in these cases. So what are the four mechanisms or four pillars for heart failure with reducing treatment is these are the uh, four mechanisms which you have to affect. One is sympathetic nervous system by the beta blockers, serine angiotensin system by the ARDs, natriuretic peptide system by ARDs and the MRA. So this is basically the four classes which have to be given in all the patients with heart failure with reducing caption. So there is no difference between a diabetic and a non-diabetic in these cases. So all patients should have a beta blocker. All patients should have a SGLT2 inhibitor, irrespective of whether he is diabetic or non-diabetic. All patients should be given MRIs and all patients should be given ACE armies if his patient allows. Additional treatment, if he is very symptomatic, if he is volume overload, diuretic in the form of your fusamide or thalidine group could be added in these cases. If are willing to be added, then these patients have a the heart rate more than 70, despite maximally tolerated beta blockers. Because we usually see patients are being given prescribed evaporating without giving beta blocker. That should not be the policy. First, beta blocker should be tried in these cases because beta has shown the mortality benefit. Evaporating didn't show any mortality benefit in these patients. So if they are not able to tolerate maximum tolerated beta blocker dose and still their heart rate is more than 70, then prescribe them evaporating. Uh, Omicadil is not available in India, adenosine, we, uh, our population it causes significant BP fall, so we don't use it. Recently, Verisuguan has been introduced in our setup and it has shown that they have a significant hospitalization reduction in these cases we have to give. So these are the four pillars of the therapy and these pillars should be started as soon as possible. Earlier the concept was you have to give a sequential treatment, okay, start beta blogger, then wait for two weeks, then add R, A for R, E, then wait for MRA. Now the concept is as early as you start in these cases, as early the benefit comes. Within six weeks of, as small as six weeks of initiation, you have seen the graph getting diverted whether these patients on all four pillars or not. So what is the best time to initiate? Once you see the OPD or you see in the hospital patient admission, you have to start with in hospital these drugs to be started. What about the treatment for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? That means the patient has clinical symptoms uh, but has her or his ejection fraction is more than 50 percent. The biggest uh, problem is in diagnosing these patients because if you, it's a common scenario of obese female, diabetic for 15 years, same SARS cov we always say it's because of obesity. We never know that it's health care. So always go for their echocardiography and a BNP in these cases and rule out other causes in these cases. Treatment, there is no difference in the treatment among diabetic versus non-diabetic but the challenge is for the health pet, we have a very limited treatment available to us. Only two drugs have shown, there were these are different trials which was compared between your health pet patients, SGLT2, MRLs, RDs and uh, ARDs. Only two drugs and have shown SGLG2 inhibitors which have shown your mortality and morbidity benefit in these cases. So this was the, uh, having across this. So if we see the effect three things, still only, only two drugs are there. One is diuretic, other is SGLG2 inhibitors. The rest we are at present, we don't have a big paraphernalia for many drugs in these cases. And most important becomes your treatment of the etiology and the other cardiovascular morbidities. That means if she is hypertensive, Give her antihypertensive if need to be controlled, or if she is obese, ask her to lose weight, or if there is no other cause, you have to increase these cases. So, what are the comorbidities? If she is a diabetic, all the target are SGLT less than 7%. SGLT2 should be the first line treatment in these cases. GLP1 analogs, they have shown that they have been decreased high risk for isosteroidic, but you have to avoid your gluteins and thighs in these cases. This trial published yesterday on 25th August in NGM, it evaluated GLP uh, analog and they found that the patient with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction with obesity, they gave it a 2.4 mg once a weekly in a one population compared to a placebo and they found significant reduction in your 
clinical status, it was a basically a clinical status study and they found significant reduction in your clinical symptoms in these by KCG gates and as cold and there was significant reduction in body weight. So now the CRISPR hepatic can maybe now GLP might increase in the class if they are by using hepatic treatment in these cases. So if we ask what about the mildly reduced, mildly reduced 40 to 50 persons, still only two drugs are available, diabetic and DAPA. What about the anti-diabetics in heart failure? A patient, uh, especially for a physician, which anti-diabetics should be preferred in these cases and which anti-diabetics should be avoided in these cases? So there have been different classes of drugs which have been evaluated. The most widely studied drug is your SGLT2 inhibitor and the mechanism I told it is multifactorial. And clinical trials, irrespective of your addiction fraction, have shown there is significant reduction in these patients of the hospitalization and mortality. So SGLT2 inhibitor in a diabetic with heart failure should be prescribed in all the cases. What about the GLP analogs? GLP analogs, they have another very strong data available to us, which is they have a neutral effect. The only thing the recently yesterday trial might change now the recommendation with GLP analogs. DPT-4 inhibitors, you have to be a little uh, so cautious before starting these cases because sasagliptin has shown to decrease the risk of heart failure hospitalization in these patients and citagliptin and glagliptin has a neutral effect. So citagliptin can be prescribed in these cases with the patients with a diabetic with heart failure. Metformin, metformin is the oldest drug but the tragedy with metformin is we don't have any randomized control trials with this drug. So we don't know the exact data, but if it is suggested to be safe in these patients, it can be prescribed. Only issue is the lactic acidosis component. So if the patient is not in heart failure, is not PH, is okay, this drug should be given in these patients. Sulfonylureas, we have conflicting data. Some trials show that it increases the mortality, and some show that there is no effect. So we don't have a very clear picture till now. The only drug which has to be avoided in these cases in the class 3 uh, recommendation is the thiazolidolones, pyazolidolone, rosiglidolone, which have been shown to increase the risk of heart failure hospitalization and should be never given in these patients. So this is basically the protocol which we have to follow in these patients. Patients with diabetic with heart failure, irrespective of your ejection fraction, you have to start. You have to start with SGLT2 inhibitor. And after SGLT2 is hard, sugar is not controlled, we can add GLP, citagliptin, metformin, or an insulin. Class 3 not to be given are thiazolidin drugs and saxogliptin in these cases. There is the ADA guidelines in 2022 which said that these three uh, groups of drugs, metformin, SGLT, and GLP, all have shown that they have a better to prescribe in diabetics as compared to non other drug classes of drug. So if we come to the conclusion of this, uh, the, the presentation, we know the pathophysiology of heart failure and diabetes is multifactorial. There is very college, it can be your stage A heart failure, there can be your stage C heart failure, it will both preserve, reduce and mildly reduce addiction fraction. Basic treatment control is HDLNC, by calorie restriction and anti-diabetic. The only proven drug till now for available is SDLG2 inhibitors. And treatment for heart failure with reduced addiction fraction or a preserved addiction fraction, there is no difference. Both diabetics and non diabetics, you have to prescribe the same medications. With healthcare, there is a diagnosing challenge and the treatment is limited to with us. We have to either give diabetic or NGOG to the better in these cases. Thank you. Last year, that it's considered to be a miracle drug. 
But what is the exact mechanism which is happening around the cases, it's still not very clear. So there have been a, a hypothesis, either changes in metabolism, it is still called hepatocardial apoptosis in these cases, or there have been the gene levels, they have been doing it. They have been studying with that with small mice studies, in which they have shown there has some change in the genes levels. But still, exactly if you ask me, we don't know. Because it's packed with your SLG2 glycosuria and your diabetic effect. But in, as we went through the trials, it started showing that there had been changes in your other cardiovascular mortality also. which compared DAPA with enfagliflozin. We, if you ask me when I prescribe DAPA and when I prescribe IMPA in our cases, still there is no clear-cut demarcation which has been uh, made. The only thing is EGFR. IMPA has been done with EGFR till 20, whereas DAPA has been done till 35. So if I find a very borderline uh, threatening levels, I prefer an IMPA in these cases. And if I find a threat that getting clear is okay, then I go for a DAPA in these cases. But there is no upper hand of which drug is not still not in the thing. Then you say that you have to pack all the four class of drugs simultaneously. But usually what happens in the district patient rate of heart failure, usually it can be strategic from the start to get injured or heart failure, it can start to get injured from the start to get diabetic. Then you stop the diabetic, then you start to get the 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 start. See, that's a usual channel practical problem because guidelines, whatever recommend, like in our setup also, I am not able to start RD in every case because they develop hypotension, especially in our remnant population who have a very small body surface area. We are not able to start RD immediately in these cases. So what we start is we give a diuretic. We don't stop the diuretic. Infusion or IV, if I am able to uh, decrease the dose, or if I am having a 24 hours, I am having a stable dose in these cases. Then you have to add your beta blocker and your SGLG2 inhibitors. Like trials also have shown when to start SGLG2 inhibitors. Once the IV diuretic dose has been stabilized or you have stopped the IV diuretic dose, then start with SGLG2 inhibitors. So what we do is IV diuretic, we are not escalating, it has become stabilized. Add SGLG2 and a beta blocker in these cases. Once the patient is able to tolerate, then we add your maybe in a 24 or 48 hours time, we add a uh, army in these cases with a very lower dose, not recommended, we start with 25, it's not recommended because it's always a start with 50, but in Indian population we are not able to start with 50 milligrams. So, IV diuretic, stabilize, go with SGLT2 and uh, MRAs and beta blockers and then army. Almost, I am absolutely honored that you accepted our invitation as a speaker here. I know you have a very busy schedule and you could squeeze out a little bit of time for us. We are grateful. Uh, Ma'am, this was like a very uh, educative teaching session for me actually. I have imbibed everything like a gospel. I just want to ask you one small question, Ma'am. Uh, like we used to practice earlier back in the days during my MD time that we used to try to achieve and titrate the maximum dose of beta blockers. Do we still practice that? Okay. Still still practice. Advisable. Always advisable if the blood pressure is allowing you increase the beta blocker. Because maximum effect will be done at the target dose of it. So it's always advisable to start. Because we usually see evabrevin is being added very quickly in these patients. We should wait for starting evabrevin. If BP is allowing, give a maximum tolerated dose to these patients. But you know, tragedy is in Indian population, I would say only 10% are able to get the target dose. I don't know how many we have targeted about 25 milligram daily. We have very few patients who are giving. Maximum we touch is 12.5 in our setup. Very rarely go to 25. So if it is 12.5 also, give that dose, but always try to go for a target dose in these cases. Target. If the heart rate is getting less than 60, it's okay. You cannot increase because then these patients are with bradycardia and very symptomatic. So if you're getting a target of 60 to 70, then it's perfect. Then you have to increase the dose. No, it will lead to bradycardia in these cases.
Thank you, ma'am, for such an wonderful and interactive session. Now I'd like to uh, request all the chairpersons to come on the stage to facilitate our speaker. Please give her a big round of applause. Now to felicitate our respected chairpersons, I would like to request Dr. Sana Ashlai, Assistant Professor Department of Natural Biology to come on this stage. I would like to go first with the name Dr. Asi Jensen, Assistant Professor Department of Cardiology. Dr. S.P. Singh, sir, Associate Professor of Hamoros. And Dr. Amit Kutka, sir, Assistant Professor, Department of Surgery. Without no more delay, we we'll proceed to the next session, which would be an instrument session 2. With great enthusiasm and honor, I would like to extend a warm, warm welcome to our esteemed speaker, whose insights are poised to illuminate our thoughts and ignite stimulating discussions. We welcome on the podium Dr. Vaivar Kanti, ma'am, additional professor of San Gaime, for a much awaited session on gestational diabetes mellitus, popular disease management. And to chair the session, I would like to request Dr. Ankit Gupta, sir, associate professor, Department of Biochemistry. Dr. Mangesh Bankar, sir, Associate Professor, Department of Pharmacology, and Dr. Sana Ishlaya, ma'am, Assistant Professor, Department of Microbiology. And to do the honor of introducing this speaker, I would like to request Dr. Sana, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Dr. Babu Kanti, ma'am. She is a professor and uh, additional professor and head department of of. Uh, of uh, uh, of Sin Lani and Ma'am needs no introduction and I uh, she's all uh, she's there for the lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Sana, for your kind introduction. Now, I don't want, I hope I do justice to my topic and not make him all sleepy. The topic allotted to me is gestational diabetes mellitus and updates in management. Gestational diabetes mellitus is defined as carbohydrate intolerance with onset or first recognition during pregnancy and if the gestational diabetes mellitus is undiagnosed or inadequately treated, GGM can lead to significant maternal and fetal complications. Moreover, women with GGM and their offspring, they have great challenges and there is increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes mellitus later in their life. The outline of my presentation will be epidemiology, classification of GGM, pathogenesis, screening, diagnosis and complications. Management updates and contraception in the uh, patients with GDM in their postnatal period. Worldwide, 1 in 10 pregnancy is associated with diabetes, and 90% of which is due to gestational diabetes mellitus. In India, the incidence is 10 to 14.3%. In India itself, there is great diversity in the incidence of GDM due to the different vast diversity in the ethnic group, the uh, state-wise population, the eating, uh, eating and dietary habits of the uh, population, and also in the trimester-wise, if we see 
that in the 16 weeks period, the incidence is 16.3%, uh, while in 23 weeks of pregnancy, the incidence increases to 61.3%. According to WHO and National Diabetes Data Group, they have recognized and they have classified the diabetes of pregnancy into th uh, three groups, that is pre-gestational diabetes with pre-existing uh, type 1 or type 2 diabetes, gestational diabetes, and just any kind of diabetes that occurs first in the pregnancy. About the pathogenesis, pregnancy is a diabetogenic condition and there is progressive increase in the insulin resistance. Why there is increase in the insulin resistance? The symptom uh, gets, uh, the placenta is fully formed up, uh, up to 16 weeks and from there it secretes hormones like human placental lactogen, cortisol, estriol, progesterone, these hormones are anti-insulin and they cause insulin resistance. There is increased lipolysis and mother utilizes fatty acids and spares glucose for the fetus. And there is changes in the gluconeogenesis, alanine and other amino acids which are major gluconeogenic source in mother is preferentially used by the fetus. So, due to increased insulin resistance, there is less uptake of uh, uh, glucose to, into the maternal cell and there is increased glucose level in the blood <coughs> and that can be utilized by the fetus for its growth. So, the, there is universal screening done for Southeast Asian population and in India as they have high prevalence of gestational diabetes mellitus. So there are various kind of screening methods. There is one uh, step approach, two step approach, but I am going to deal with the gypsy guidelines which is adopted by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and it is the Indian guideline. As the government of Indian, uh, India guidelines, it recommends universal screening that is to one step to our 75 gram glucose tolerance test which is irrespective of the meal. Patient takes 75 gram of glucose with 300 ml of water and if she drinks it in 5 to 10 minutes and if she vomits in within 30 minutes the test is, is repeated next day but if she vomits after 30 minutes the test is continued and after 2 hours we take the we, we check for the blood glucose level and if, if it comes more than 140 mg per dl, the diagnosis of gestational diabetes mellitus is made. We are supposed to do the first uh, uh, screening for GDM during the first visit of the patient and at 24 to 28 weeks. But what if the patient comes in the third trimester, that is after 28 weeks. After 28 weeks, whenever the patient comes, we can go for screening the patient with two R75 gram glucose tolerance test, preferably in 32 to 34 weeks of gestation. These are the screening, these are the latest screening guidelines from Government of India. And here we say whenever a pregnant woman comes to us, at her very first visit, we have to do her oral glucose tolerance test. And if after two hours the RBS comes to be 140, then it is diagnosed as GDM or it is uh, the test is called positive and if it is uh, if the RBS is uh, the postprandial blood sugar is less than 140 then it is called negative and the test is repeated at 24 to 28 weeks of gestation and again if the two hours uh, blood sugar is more than 140 mg per day it is diagnosed as medium and if it, if it is less than 140 mg per day it is uh, labeled as no, uh, normal ANC. So, what is the advantage of diabetes in pregnancy study group criteria? Here, the patient need not be fasting. There's, there is least disturbance in routine activity and it is both screening and uh, diagnostic. So, this is the latest uh, recommendation that previously this test was thought to be screening, but now it is screening as well as diagnostic test and it is simple, economic and feasible. Here is the list of screening protocols, we can see that the Gypsy and the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare India, here we can see that we are doing
with 75 grams of glucose. The screening is done with 75 grams of glucose, and the test, uh, the blood sugar level is measured two hours after the glucose intake. And if, if it is uh, more than 140 mg per deal, the test is said to be positive or gestational diabetes mellitus. There is an entity called overt diabetes mellitus and in this if we find that the random blood sugar level is more than 200 mg per deal or fasting blood sugar is more than 125 mg per deal or after 2 hours of 75 gram glucose tolerance test if it, is, if it comes more than 200 mg per deal it is labeled as overt diabetes mellitus. So gestational diabetes mellitus has its complications. There are short term complications and there are long term complications. The short term complication, complication is for both mother and fetus. In the short term complication for mother, there are high chances of having preeclampsia, eclampsia, prolonged labor or dystocia, caesarean delivery, surgical complications and increased chances of postpartum hemorrhage. In short term complica complication of the offspring, there are high chances of fetal macrosomia, shoulder dystocia, collarbone fracture, brachial plexus injury and asphyxia. The long term complications in the mother are they have increased chances of having type 2 diabetes mellitus later in their life and cardiovascular diseases, obesity, ophthalmic, renal disease and long term complications in the offspring are they have increased chances of obesity, cardiovascular, neurodevelopment and neuropsychiatric problems. What is the role of glycosylated hemoglobin in cases of gestational diabetes mellitus? There is limited role because the actually the glycosylated hemoglobin it decreases in normal pregnancy and it is not directly measuring the postprandial hyperglycemia because postprandial hyperglycemia is <coughs> responsible for increase in fetal weight or macrosomia. The management options with us is. We can guide the patient during her pre-pregnancy period by counseling her and talking to her about management of diabetes, management of comorbid medical conditions. In antenatal period, we can screen and diagnose, monitor her blood glucose level, and we can do surveillance of the mother and fetus. During labor, we have to decide the timing of delivery and the mode of delivery, and we have to control the intrapartum uh, sugar level. And in post period, we can advise her contraceptions. So the aim of the management is to maintain the normal blood glucose levels throughout the pregnancy and to avoid the periods of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. The main therapeutic goal throughout the pregnancy is to avoid adverse events caused by the uh, rise in blood sugar level, that is hyperglycemia. So according to the government of uh, the Ministry of uh, Health and Family Health, well, here the following charts have been uh, 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 made in which the pregnant woman with gestational diabetes mellitus when she comes positive during screening that is the blood sugar level is more than 140 mg per year first what we do we give her medical nutritional therapy and exercise we advise her exercise medical nutritional therapy is just control on carbohydrate portion of the of her diet and after two weeks of MNT, two hours postprandial blood sugar is done. <coughs> if after two, uh, two uh, if it comes to less than 120 mg per year, we continue the MNT and physical exercises, and we monitor the two hours postprandial blood sugar at least once monthly. But if it comes more than 120 mg per year, we start uh, anti-diabetic. First choice is insulin, but the latest guidelines say we can also uh, start uh, give the patient metformin. In these cases where we are giving oral hypoglycemic or insulin, we have to monitor the fasting blood sugar uh, level as well and to ask postprandial blood sugar level also every third day or more frequently in case of insulin and bi-weekly in cases of metformin. How do we monitor the fetal uh, Features in uh, GTM, we have to do the baseline ultrasound for the effective fetal weight. We have to do go for level two ultrasound in on 18 to 20, uh, 22 two weeks. That is TIFA, which is targeted imaging of uh, for fetal anomalies, for major uh, major malformations, and we also go for fetal echocardiograph um, after 24 weeks. 
26 weeks onwards, we look for the growth and liker. And in third trimester, we frequently repeat the growth gene to look for the, any kind of accelerated growth in the fetus. So the treatment option for GDM is MNT and exercise, insulin and metformin, and there is an upcoming molecule that is myoinositol, which is found to be beneficial in cases of GDM. So discussing on MNT in GDM, it is nothing but carbohydrate controlled meal plan with goals to achieve and maintain maternal normal glycemia and this is self-management therapy and exercise is done along with the MNT therapy. ACOG, DIPC, they have level A recommendation for medical nutrition therapy in GDM and 80 to 90 percent of the GDM can be managed by MNT. Once the diagnosis of GDM is made, MNT is given for two weeks. And if the GDM diagnosis is made in the third trimester, MNT is given for only one week. If MNT fails to achieve a target of giving uh, oral hypoglycemics or insulin is to maintain the fasting glucose level less than 70 to 95 mg per day and postprandial glucose level less than 140 mg per day. And if, if we are not able to achieve this on MNT for two weeks, we start insulin or metformin. So benefits of MNT in GDM is it helps to control the blood sugar, allow less intake of medication, maintain healthy weight gain, prevent macrosomia and makes mother feel better. Now for our patients, so to help them in MNT, we have the uh, my cake method. In this, we advise the patient that in her cake, she should have half or the plate covered with fruits and vegetables, quarter with protein and quarter with grain. Along with MNT, she has to do exercises, 30 minutes of no moderate intensity exercise, walking at least 5 days per week and stationary bike, uh, biking, yoga and breathing exercises. So if MNT fails after 2 weeks, we come on pharmacological therapy and the most commonly used therapies are insulin and oral hypoglycemic agents. Insulin is the first line drug in the management of diabetes in pregnancy and it does not cross the blood placental barrier. There are various regimes for giving insulin, 4 times daily regime, 2 times daily regime, but we are going to follow the government of Indian guidelines. That is, we have to start the human insulin three weeks, 30 to 70. 30 is regular insulin and 70 is uh, uh, intermediate acting insulin. It is given subcutaneously 30 minutes before breakfast, once a day. And MNT and physical exercises is continued. The dose of insulin is calculated by the blood glucose level, which is shown in the chart. Now, insulin therapy is advised by uh, as advised by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare 2018, it says whenever uh, the pregnant woman is diagnosed with GDM, that is GDM is one, more than 140 mg per year, she has to take MNT for 2 weeks and after taking MNT for 2 weeks, again her 2 hours postprandial blood sugar is measured and if it is less than 120 mg per year, we have to continue the MNT and exercise but if it is more than 120 mg per year, even after MNT for 2 weeks, we have to start insulin in uh, 30 is to 70. And the blood sugar level at between 120 to 160, we have to give her 4 units, which means 160 to 200, we have to give 6 units, and in more than 200, we have to give, give 8 units. And then again, every third day, the, uh, the fasting blood sugar level and 2 hours postprandial blood sugar level is measured and with in our mind that fasting blood sugar level should be less than 95 mg per deal and the post prandial blood sugar should be less than 120 mg per deal and if it is uh, so that we continue MNT and physical exercises but if fasting is less and post prandial is more than 120 mg per deal we add one time insulin that is pre-breakfast along with MNT and physical exercises. But if fasting blood sugar is also raised 
and post immune vegetable is also rose. We add insulin uh, in pre dinner, that is per unit in pre dinner. And then we repeatedly uh, do the uh, uh, glucose uh, fasting sugar level and keep it is every three days. And according to it, we accelerate the insulin doses. And MMT and uh, exercises is continued. There are, these are the uh, sites where insulin therapy can be given. Now coming to the second dose, uh, second uh, pharmacological treatment that is metformin. As the government of India guidelines 2018, it can be used in GDM after 20 week of pregnancy. The ACOG 2018 says it is a reasonable, uh, reasonable alternative to insulin if the woman does not want insulin, won't be able to safely administer insulin and cannot afford insulin. The metformin has advantage that, that there are no hypoglycemic episodes, does not stimulate fetal pancreas, does not adversely affect breastfeeding. It freely crosses the placental barrier, but however, there has been no literature which says that it causes a genital anomaly or any fetal uh, adverse effect. The newer molecule which is upcoming in management of gestational diabetes mellitus is uh, inositol. And this myoinositol or MI, it modulates glucose transport, glucose utilization and glycogen synthesis. In gestational diabetes, it has been seen that myoinositol in 2 gram per day for 8 weeks improves, improves fasting insulin and glucose levels. There has been various researches right from 2019 to 2023 and going through several papers which says that myoinositol has a role in prevention of gestational diabetes mellitus. And the, uh, the obstetrical outcomes and the neonatal and perinatal outcomes, they were improved in cases with, uh, just, uh, in cases where the, uh, uh, the uh, researchers have uh, given uh, MI and uh, in comparison to placebo group. The total insulin requirement is also decreased in cases where a uh, patient has been given insulin along with myositol and uh, they have concluded that oral supplementation with myositol in dose of 1 gram twice daily when started soon after diagnosis of gestational diabetes mellitus is effective in achieving the glycemic control. So after giving all these drugs we should be aware of how to recognize, the, uh, recognize and manage hypoglycemia. So uh, what is hypoglycemia? Hypoglycemia is diagnosed when blood sugar level is less than 70 mg per year and it should be immediately recognized and treatment should be given. There, uh, there, there are symptoms uh, like uh, early symptoms, severe symptoms and uncommon symptoms, the tremors of hands, sweating, palpitation, uh, hunger, easy fatigability, etc. And here, what we have to do to manage the, uh, this uh, hypoglycemia, we have to follow the rule of 15. Rule of 15 means we have to give the patient 3 tablespoons or 15 gram of glucose powder or 6 tablespoons of sugar immediately when the blood sugar level is less than 70 mg per year and after taking it she, she should take a rest and after again after 15 minutes she, she has to uh, test her blood sugar level and if it continues again she has to consume uh, 15 gram of uh, carbohydrate uh, or 6 tablespoons of uh, sugar and then if there is more than one episode of hypoglycemia she should consult the doctor immediately. Now coming to the timing of delivery, AM GDM is GDM which is controlled on diet. As we are aware that diet controls 80 to 90 percent of the GDM basis, the A1 GDM is on diet and A2 GDM is on uh, GDM controlled on insulin. So in both the cases, we have to deliver the patient beyond 39 weeks, after 39 weeks. And in poorly controlled GDM, the fetus between, we have to deliver the patient between 37 to 39 weeks. And in those cases, the blood sugar is not controlled even on, after hospitalization, we can deliver the patient between 34 to 37 weeks. And if there is any normal antipartum fetal testing, then we have to uh, terminate the, uh, do the delivery uh, immediately. So, during intrapartum management of diabetes, we have to maintain the glucose level between 90 to 120 mg per year. The morning dose of insulin is omitted. Two hourly blood sugar level is done. We start IV infusion with normal saline. 
and regular insulin is added according to the blood sugar level shown in the chart below. And if there are chances of blood sugar level less than 90 mg per year, IV DNS is given. So when we are going to do cesarean section, according to the guidelines, elective cesarean section is done if the fetal weight is more than 4 kg at 39 weeks of gestation. A light meal and light dose of insulin are given, morning dose is permitted and insulin is given according to the sliding scale. The, now coming to the contraceptive here, long acting reversible contraceptives like intramuscular devices and implants are highly effective and safe and best for contraception. The take home message is universal screening for GBM is recommended. Intervene all the patients to improve fetal outcome. MNT plus physical activity is the cornerstone of GDM treatment. My view 80 to 90 percent were treated by MNT and physical activity. Insulin is a standard therapy, but oral hypoglycemic agents are being considered recently. Good glycemic control in preconceptual period and throughout pregnancy is the key to successful outcome. Annual blood sugar monitoring in women with GDM in the view of future risk of diabetes mellitus. This was all. Thank you. Hope I did not make you sleepy. I hope there are no any questions. So we will go with the Felix program. So for the Felix of our speaker, I would like to request all the chairpersons to be on the stage to provide a moment to answer. Please everyone give her a big round of applause. Persons, I would like to request Dr. Avay Singh, sir, Associate Professor, Department of CFM, to come on the stage to facilitate our chairpersons. Since he is not here, I would like to request Dr. Avay, sir, Assistant uh, Professor, to come on the stage and to facilitate our chairpersons. I would like to call go with Dr. Amrit Gupta, sir, Associate Professor, Department of Biochemistry. <laughs> Dr. Mangesh Bandra, sir, Associate Professor, Department of Pharmacology. And finally, Dr. Sana Islaiman, Assistant Professor, Department of Microbiology. Thank you all. Without any delay, let's move ahead with the program. And the next session is going to be on neurology. And for the session, we would like to invite the chairpersons in the stage. The chairpersons for the session are Dr. Arvind Kumar Suman, sir, Assistant Professor, Department of Neurosurgery. Professor Prabhu Joshi, Professor of Physiology. Dr. Bhupendra Singh, Associate Professor, Department of Anesthesia. And Dr. Abhay Singh, Associate Professor, Department of CFM. With utmost respect and enthusiasm, let's invite our next speaker, an esteemed luminary, endocrine professor, Dr. Archana Varman, and to put forward invaluable insights on hyperactive stroke updates and management. And to introduce her, I would like to request Professor Prabhu Joshi, sir, to come on stage. My honor and privilege to introduce our eminent speaker, Dr. Archana Ramanan. And uh, again, I don't think she needs any introduction to this library faculty. So, without wasting any time, uh, ma'am, stage is all yours.
patient went for the sleep at 9 o'clock and with uh, 10 o'clock and wake up at 7 o'clock at Halloween. So we don't know what is the time of the onset. So the last known where does not define that is the time of the onset. So there is an urgent need to find the effective new treatment for the patients who are having that is the unknown time of the onset, unwitnessed stroke, and those who are not having the larger cell occlusion. When you have the larger cell occlusion, then you have more uh, options. But if the patient does not have the larger cell occlusion, then only we can have the cancer composition. So identify the patients who are within the 4.5 hours, but last known well is more than 4.5 hours. So how we can identify? That is a tissue-based criteria. That is using the MRI as a biomarker, using the DW where this map as an MRI code, that you are getting the single stages from DW, but there is no single stages to the player. This indicates that the onset of the stroke is within the 4.5 hours, irrespective of the last known well, because most of the time, what happens? The patient wake up like 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. Most of the time, the onset of the stroke is in the 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock. So, patient is within the therapeutic window, but we don't know what is the exact time. So, using this type of MRI basis criteria, we can go for the therapeutic therapy. And it has very high specificity, like 71 to 93 percent, and specificity of 48. So, the important trial regarding this is the Amal Business trial, Wake Up trial, and the Thoughts trial. So, the upper panel is showing the DW images, and the lower panel is showing the player images. So, when you are seeing any signal changes in the player, but no signal changes on the, uh, any signal changes in the DW, no signal changes in the player, this indicates that the onset of the stroke is less than 4.5 hours. But you are getting the single changes in DW and player both the onset of the stroke is more than 4.5 hours. So this is one of the very important uh, landmark study uh, that has given us the opportunity to summarize more number of the patients. So the first trial is an MR witness trial, IV thrombolysis with antiphase in MR and selected patients. So the criteria was used for this is the MRI, tissue-based criteria for looking at thrombolysis. And this particular trial is to know the safety of IV antiplase in the MRI selected patients. So phase 2B, open level, multi-centered trial, antiplase was used in the dose of 0.9 mg per kg 48 and quantitative DW pair this map was used. Last known well was up to 24 hours and around the 80 patients were enrolled and only one patient had a symptomatic so what was the conclusion? The MRI witness trial confirmed the safety of antiplase in the quantitative DW pair this map in selected subset of the patients who, who are having the unknown time of the stroke, that is unwitnessed stroke or the wake up stroke. So we can go with this particularly DW pair this map to thrombolyze the black of the patients. So the next. Uh, this is a landmark trial, MRI guided thrombolysis for a stroke with unknown time of the onset, wake up trial, European multicentric randomized placebo controlled uh, phase 3 trial to know the safety of MRI based thrombolysis of unknown time of the onset. So, 503 patients were enrolled in this particular trial and they have used quantitative DW pair risk map and the last known well was up to 10.3 hours. And most of the cases are wake up. 89% of the cases are wake up stroke. And NIH is scoring a 6, that is, the patient are having that is a mild to moderate uh, stroke. And MRS2, MRS2 means the patient is able to walk without the support was achieved in 53% of the patient in the antiplase group and only 41 in the placebo group. So symptomatic uh, intracellular hemorrhage and the death were more in the antiplase group but was not significant. That is because of the, the biological effect, that is the biological effect of the thrombolytic therapy. Whenever we will give it the thrombolytic therapy, definitely there is, is going to be the more uh, brief. So this is a landmark trial showing the utility of antiplase in the image selected patient during the extended window period. So as we are moving from the time window, time frames to that is the tissue frame, 
we are moving towards the amara events for many years. So the next trial is that is uh, somebody is the articulate using the low dose of articulate. Why is this milligram per kg body weight in the patient who are having the unknown time of the onset? This one is the first trial, Japanese trial. And most in the Japanese trial, they have used the low dose of articulate and they again used the DW to bear this mass. And the dose of the articulate was 0.6 mg per kg body weight. Last dose well was 12 hours. And this particular, only 131 patients were enrolled. And the study was stopped prematurely because of positive results of the wake-up trial. So this was a neutral trial. But what was the change in the diagnosis? So patients who are having the wake-up stroke or unknown time of the onset can get the benefit of thrombolytic therapy when there is a DW player in this match. So irrespective of the time of last dose where if we are going to get the DW player in this match, if the patient is coming to wake up like 6 o'clock and coming to our emergency at 7 o'clock and we go with a DW player in this match and if there is a mismatch then we can safely go with the thrombolytic and evidence is there. Now the, there are third subset of the papers. Uh, who are coming beyond the window period, like who are coming beyond the 4.5 hours. So to identify the targeted mismatch for extended window thrombolysis, like those patients who are having the large penumbra, large salvageable tissue and very small pores. So to identify those patients may still benefit from the thrombolytic therapy independent of traditional window of eligibility. So what are the techniques by which we can select such a is why there is an MRI diffusion perfusion mismatch or CT perfusion mismatch. So the pore, which is pore, is the dead tissue. Penumbra is that is the dying tissue, that is salvageable tissue. So like if the patient is having a very small pore, like this was the patient, he is having a very small pore and large penumbra, if we get this patient at this point, Oh. 
conclude is that the patient with ischemic stroke up to 9 hours from the onset of the stroke or wake of the stroke who are having a large menkinumra or large hemorrhagic tissues who were treated with antigens achieved a better functional outcome. So the new compound is a tenecteplase. Uh, tenecteplase is a modified variant of tissue transfusion activators and it has a longer half life. So that is the one advantage it can be given in the bolus. Like antiplase is the bolus and then infusion and tenecteplase is the bolus. It is more protein specific and more resistant to tissue transfusion activators in it. So there are some important trials regarding the tenecteplase versus antiplase before hepatectomy for acute ischemic stroke patients. Those. So this is the dose of the tenecteplase in all this is study was 0.25 mg per kg body weight, antiplase 0.9 mg per kg body weight and this study was restricted to the window period of 4.5 hours and they have included only those patients who are having there is a large nasal occlusion and 202 patients were enrolled and what was a very interesting finding is that reperfusion more than 50% in the blocked artery therapy or 22% in the connector phase was in the antiplase. So the connector phase is better than the antiplase in those who are having there is a large nasal occlusion. Connector phase before the thrombectomy was associated with a higher incidence of reperfusion and better functional outcome than the antiplase. The selector place versus antiplase for acute ischemic stroke during the extended window period phase 2 trial selector place versus antiplase and the window period was extended up to 6 hours and those who are having there is a large vessel occlusion and having a very good phenomena on the CD perfusion evidence, 35 patients were enrolled and complete revascularization at 24 hours was seen. 80% of the patients in the tenecta phase versus the antiplase. So that this is definitely the tenecta phase is superior in those who are having this large nasal occlusion. And MRS function outcome was also better. This particular study is a penumbral based imaging technique using the thrombolysis, that is a chemical thrombolysis, up to 24 hours from the onset of the symptom. That's a very interesting study on imaging. Phase 2 trial, prospective open level randomized trial, up to 24 hours from the onset, the next phase was used in a dose of 0.25 mg per kg body weight, back to 25 mg. And numerous salvage volume was higher in the next phase than that other volume. So the recent guidelines, recent European stroke guidelines in 2023, like if a patient is coming within the window period, so the tenecta place is as safe and as effective as the antiplase. But when the patient is coming within the window period and having a large vessel occlusion, tenecta place is superior to the antiplase. So this is one, this is a very recent recovery. So doing the thrombolysis in the difficult situation, because there are initially, there are many contraindications for doing the thrombolysis. So there are more reasons not to do the thrombolysis than to do the thrombolysis, but gradually there is a lot of changes in the guidelines has occurred and so this guidelines has become much more liberal so that we can thrombolyze the maximum number of patients. So patients who are having an unknown time of the stroke or wake up a stroke, again we can go with it with a different MRI based criteria, diffusion perfusion based trial or diffusion flare mismatch or hope numeral mismatch or we can go with a clinical and CT mismatch that patient is having a 10 centimetria and you are getting the CT very good CT scan and again this shows that there is a mismatch. That this, this indicates that the patient has a good collateral. You can go for the compulsions. And next question. Those who are having such a wide uh, stroke that is NIFS scoring less than 5, so place or is again recommended in those who are having the mild but disability the stroke. Disability means they are having the aphasia or the aphasia. Patients who are having a severe stroke, like NISS is scoring more than 25, there is more chances of a bleed, but again, antiplase is reasonable. Age more than 80 years, antiplase is safe and effective as with the younger age group. Seizures at the onset, initially it was a contraindication, but now if you have the evidence that this particular weakness is because of the stroke, this is not so strict, again you can go with that as the antiplase. And those who are having that is this moderate to the severe stroke and is still improving, but is still at the time when you see the patient is having that is a moderate.
moderate weakness, again you can go with the different articulation. And one major issue when we are treating the patient, patient are already having a stroke yes. and they came again with the, what the component is currently or having a recurrence of the stroke and patient is already from dual antiplate or single antiplate plate. So, in such type of group, again, the antiplate overweight with a small increase of the risk of symptomatic infrastructure. So to summarize, the intravenous thrombolysis with tissue plasmodogen activator or chemical thrombolysis improves the outcome for the patient when they are coming within the window period and treatment may improve the outcome in the selected group of the patient depending on the MRI based criteria up to 9 hours. And definitely the mechanical thrombotic will improve the outcome of the patient when they are coming within the 24 hours. But the thing is that we are extending the time window. That is not we are going to get the time. As soon as the patient comes, we have to treat the patient. It is only the for the patient that they are going to get the more opportunity to come into that window period. Like the patient is coming within the hour, we don't have to wait. We have to go for five hours. Like we have to three hours, we can wait. This is not the thing. It is only for the patient to come under this umbrella. This thing is very important for us. Yeah, to understand. So in the selective group of the patient with the acute ischemic stroke who are not qualifying the criteria for IV thrombolysis or mechanical thrombectomy that they are having that minor stroke, then dual antiplatelet with propidopril and aspirin administered within 24 hours and continue up to 21 days reduces the risk of the status of the stroke. So this is the algorithm how to approach a patient with acute if when a patient is coming within the 4.5 hours, we don't have to go with nerve investigation. We just have to go with a non contrast CT and at the most CT and two. And if there is a no large vessel occlusion, only chemical thrombolysis, large vessel occlusion, chemical and mechanical thrombotomy. If the patient is coming beyond 4.5 hours, but within the 6 hours, and if there is a large vessel occlusion, no investigation, only mechanical thrombotomy. But when patient is coming beyond 6 hours, then we have to go with the advanced neuroimaging techniques. And if there is a no large vessel occlusion, then diffusion, perfusion mismatch, and going for the chemical process. So time is very, that is very important. Like every, every, every minute, every time is very important. The genius and genius of neurons will not be both very quick as the patient. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. The house is open for any queries or questions. Regarding the decompression perineum, patient who has malignant infarction usually require decompression perineum. So in the malignant MC infarction, usually thrombolysis is contraindicated. So directly, uh, sudden can go directly uh, decompression. 
so much ma'am for an exceptional talk. Let's move ahead with the felicitation program. I would like to request all our chairpersons to come on stage to felicitate ma'am. Our two persons, I would like to request Dr. Deepak Bhakchandani, Sir, Assistant Professor for Medicine, KZNU, to be here on stage. <laughs> the chairpersons were Professor Pravul Josi, the Department of Physiology. <laughs> Associate Professor Dr. Bhupendra Singh, Sir, Department of Anesthesia. Dr. Arvind Kumar, Assistant Professor, Department of Neurosurgery. And Dr. Abhay Singh, Sir, Associate Professor, Department of CFM. to an end of this long academic journey of midterm CME by Cardiology Society. And the last, uh, there, will, there will be a last talk and chairpersons for the last talk, I would, I would like to request Dr. Ambur Syadab, Assistant Professor, Department of Medicine, KZNU, to be here. Dr. Arya Pal, Assistant Professor, Department of Science. So what is the uh, problem with metabolic acidosis? Because this increases the mortality in the IQ patient. A patient may have pH less than 70 uh, 752. Uh, they have high mortality according to the various studies. So he gave the most common cause of uh, metabolic acidosis in the admitted patient of IQ. So this is a study. Thank you. 
Gracias. 